Author and game designer Alex Kingsley recently released a novel RPG combo. As someone who did the same thing last month, I was excited to check out how a fellow writer adapted their novel into a tabletop game. Creatures of Ruin is a short and straightforward framework to play in the world of the novel, Empress of Dust, in which our world has fallen and been taken over by titanic animals called Desert Walkers. The world of Empress is full of strange and frightening beasts, two-brained netherworms, metal-eating steel mites, and of course, the towering mega crabs which dominate the novel's cover. Though the rules of creatures are somewhat brief, I did find an interesting dichotomy in the mechanics between the desert walkers and humans, both which are playable. While the core resolution mechanic for humans is a d6, the desert walkers use a d20, with their own resolution table entirely. And I kind of like how big of a gulf between the two dice is. It helps get players thinking about how much grander these desert beings are than the humans shuffling around underneath their legs. Furthermore, the Desert Walkers use a separate system of health than the humans, something called impermeability. See, Desert Walkers do not die of old age, they can only be killed, which gives them something called conditional immortality. And I think that theme of conditional immortality is especially interesting in a post-apocalyptic setting about what comes after humanity shrinks into history. In the novel, most humans live in Bastion, the last city eking out a troubled existence in the middle of a vast expanse of desert. A series of civilization-ending earthquakes destroyed humanity 400 years ago, leaving the survivors to cobble a society together from the ruins. Over the centuries, humanity did rise anew, with six powerful family-led corporations holding the majority of influence in Bastion. However, separate from the corporate-focused middle class of Bastion society are the Scavengers, a class of labor often indentured whose role is to travel beyond the walls of the city and find remnants of technology and supplies from the old world. Creatures of Ruin gives us some insight into what one might find out there, anything from broken cars to still edible peeps. The Society of Bastion benefits from the work of the scavengers. Any old tech or equipment they find gets passed through their commission, eventually ending up in the hands of the six families, who use that pre-apocalyptic information to develop goods and services. But the scavengers themselves see little benefit, forced into the scorching desert to delve into unstable ruins, dodging ravenous monsters all the while. So put upon are the scavengers that they must abandon the names from their old lives, instead taking on the names of brands from centuries past. It's not uncommon for a scav team to consist of people named Lenovo or Oreo. And I think this last bit, using brand names as a tool of dehumanization, is indirectly in conversation with the novel's concerns about immortality. Because, in a story set 400 years in the future, why would anyone remember the names of institutions or corporations that have been gone for hundreds of years? Well, the existence of the scavengers themselves answers that question. Ever since we started ramping up plastic production in the 40s and 50s, human society has increasingly been able to create long-lasting, durable materials that do not degrade or break down in the same way that cloth and wood and even various metals do. Half of all plastics ever created were produced after 2002. So it makes sense to me that, while in 2024, you probably can't name a company from the year 1624, there would probably still be remnants of contemporary society blowing around in the sands outside of Bastion 400 years later. Brands in particular have distinctive names, designed to stick in the mind of a consumer, and unique and colorful packaging to catch the eye on supermarket shelves. So when scavers go digging for supplies from the past, it's extremely likely they'll have come across an Oreo wrapper or two. When the scavenger's commission replaces their names with brands, it's something of an homage to the past, but I think it's also a very sad admission of what would be left behind in the face of climate apocalypse. The things that future people will remember us by won't be our words and cultures, Decomposition Time estimates that in less than ideal conditions, even a modern book will struggle to stay intact for more than a hundred years. And God only knows how fragile the internet is. No, it's the objects we made to last forever that are going to outlive us, no matter how useless they will be in the context of the future. I'm not a climate doomer, I'm really not, but Kingsley's portrayal of a world where the only everlasting remnants of our current era are consumables, manufactured for consumers long dead, does prompt my thoughts to stray toward the catastrophic. However, I don't think Kingsley's game and novel believe that immortality is destined to be a reminder of humanity's hubris. We see their hopeful tone in the way dependence on humans is spoken of in Creatures of Ruin's titular myth. 
But the true masters of the immortal, the desert walkers, and especially the mega crabs, choose a path out of the wreckage of the past, a path that defies expectations for the new most powerful beings on the planet. If you read through the descriptions of the desert walkers, both in the game and the novel, it's clear the planet is carcinizing, with animals developing increasingly crab-like features. In a few thousand years, it wouldn't surprise me if the world of Empress was entirely dominated by crabs. But, at least for now, it does not seem that the crabs seek conquest. By contrast, the crabs have a much different philosophy portrayed in their death mechanics. Quote, If you feel your character has achieved inner peace, then you ascend to the serenity. End quote. And for a group of nearly immortal creatures, I think that's a very interesting belief, that the ultimate goal is not perpetual motion, but to find some sort of permanent satisfaction. The game suggests that desert walkers can speak to those who have gone beyond, dispensing wisdom to the creatures that still need it. It's a quiet, humble place to end for a group of beings whose enormous frames dominate the world of the novel, but I think it's a fitting one. I think a lot about what people will think of me when I'm gone, when the servers of YouTube are cold and lifeless, when even the people I've met can't recall my name. And I don't know if that's a useful exercise. Chances are, if people remember you in a thousand years, you were probably a bad person, or perhaps were built from something designed to outlast people entirely. I think Empress of Dust and Creatures of Ruin ask readers to consider a better form of legacy, one uncoupled from actual immortality, one which leaves less plastic to choke the histories of their descendants. Perhaps the best way to live on is simply to live well, to teach and love those you are able, and when the weight of history finally catches up to you, hope you might find serenity in the silent desert wind. Thanks everybody for watching. I really appreciate anyone who takes the time to see what I'm saying about tabletop games. If you want to help me keep the channel going, you can send me a tip at my Ko-Fi in the video description. My background picture is liquefied image by Adrian on Unsplash. My profile picture is by Eater Outsider on Tumblr. If you want to find more of my work, I'm at AAVoid on Blue Sky, Monster Factory Fanfic on Tumblr, but my main site is aavoid.com, where I talk about games and writing. I also just released a novel RPG combo, Detente for the Ravenous, which you can find at aaronsxl.itch.io. Uh, if you like spire and heart and horrific body horror, I think you should check it out. I also do another podcast, Mortified the Friendship Quest, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis. Uh, we just talked about Beetlejuice, the 1988 movie, and Beetlejuice the musical, the 2018 musical, uh, which was really, really good. Uh, thanks as always for watching. Uh, until next video, see ya!